Great, and with that, let me turn it over to Munker's CEO and founder, Dr. Stefan Pauls. Pablo, thank you very much and a very warm welcome from my end to, to the audience. I must say I'm very much delighted to be here today. It's our first deal talk uh, and there's more to come. And of course, it's no coincidence that we have uh, today a guest here with whom I share uh, a lot of my personal history as well. I'm talking about Johannes Hood, who is running KKR in EMEA. And Johannes is not only you know, part of my history, he's also, of course, part of KKR's history, but uh, even more so, he's really part of the history of private equity in general. He joined KKR in 1999. And at, least at that time, it was really a niche industry. Yeah? At KKR, well, we had like 30 people being employed and the company had uh, around 20 billion US dollar under, under management. Today, we are talking about KKR as a company that is globally active with more than 1,500 employees and more than 270 billion assets under management. Johannes has been you know, running this company in Europe, of course, is an entrepreneur uh, by heart and by mind. And I'm very excited to have you here, Johannes. Thank you, so, Let me kick it off, uh, Johannes, with the first question uh, I have, and I think many people will, will think about it in a similar way. What we are seeing is, of course, you know, COVID-19. Uh, many people expected uh, a very you know, deep um, decline uh, in, in uh, equity markets. We are seeing government spending uh, and um, easing from the Federal Reserve Banks uh, globally. What is the firm's and what is your personal view on the macro environment? Well, thanks, Stefan. First of all, I'm delighted to be here. And um, uh, I'm delighted that uh, Moonfair has been such a great success. Um, and uh, uh, as, as Stefan said, Stefan spent part of his career at KKR. Um, and it was uh, uh, great to have him with us. And uh, uh, I do think this democratization of investing in our industry is a very important step. And um, I, I think the, the Moonfair program is, is, a, is a really great contributor to the broader access into illiquid asset classes. So uh, I, I really think it's fantastic what you've built there, Stefan. Um, in terms of the, uh, uh, our view on the macro, um, I think there's sort of two sides to the coin. First of all, we continue to see an incredible amount of stimulus uh, by all the uh, 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 central banks around the world. Um, and uh, obviously the election of uh, uh, President Biden, election of President Biden has added to that, uh, given the uh, 1.9 trillion stimulus program that he's trying to currently get through Congress. Um, so uh, no matter how much of that will come through, there will be, again, a significant amount of stimulus coming into the economy. Um, and we've seen the effect of that stimulus as it's been driving asset prices and uh, it's been driving uh, the stock market performance around the world. On the other hand, uh, we still have an economy which uh, is in, uh, I don't know if it's in the second or the third phase, but certainly continues to be significantly affected by COVID-19, uh, large parts of the economy in Europe and um, uh, less so now in the United States are uh, uh, shut down. And that has a quite a negative effect. Um, our person, my personal view is and our view as an institution is that uh, we will see uh, quite a pickup in the uh, second half of this year as vaccines uh, uh, start to uh, uh, become more and more effective and broadly distributed, broadly distributed in a broader fashion, um, uh, and uh, in industry and the economies are coming back. Um, uh, we, we think that combined with the stimulus will lead to quite a positive effect in the second half of this year. Of course, look, uh, Johannes, we are following KKI and the industry very closely. And one of the things, frankly, if I go back to 2020, that surprised us and me personally a lot is the unprecedented money that the firm KKI invested uh, in 2020. I, I remember, you know, back in post-financial crisis times, focus on portfolio investing was, call it over for 15 months, more or less. 
now the firm and you have taken a very different route. What was the, was it coincidence and was, or was there any uh, strategic rationale behind it? It's a, it, it definitely was not coincidence. Um, uh, uh, we actually, in, 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 and I think we're almost at the first anniversary, a previous anniversary, I hope we won't have a second one, uh, of when uh, COVID started. We, we sat down as a firm leadership uh, in March of last year and basically said, look, clearly our number one priority is going to have to be to look after the portfolio, after the assets that our investors have entrusted us with. Um, but we said in exactly as you just said, Stefan, in, in uh, sort of uh, the uh, uh, 07, uh, 08 period, we missed, we, we missed the beat um, in, in terms of investing um, uh, more aggressively in a period when assets maybe were available at, uh, at better valuations. And we only focused on managing the portfolio. So we, this time we went through the same learnings that we had from that period. We had task force, we had literally bi-weekly calls with all of our portfolio companies to make sure that we, we sort of share demonstrated practices and uh, we, we, we immediately address any issue. But we said, let's take 20 to 30% of our capacity and let's have that capacity focus on making proactive acquisitions. Now, given it was COVID, we were locked down, we were not able um, had to travel to see new management teams. So really most of the transactions that we worked on were transactions that we had been in discussions with pre-COVID that then had been put on hold. But we went back to the seller and said, look, we are interested in uh, continuing our discussions despite COVID. We'll take a view, a longer term view, and um, are you interested in, in entering into discussions with us? And actually a lot of them did. And I think we made some very interesting acquisitions. And certainly when I look at the state of the market right now, where prices have uh, risen quite a bit, I'm, I'm very happy that we made that decision and we took advantage of that temporary dislocation. Very helpful. When you think of COVID uh, in general, and look, we are, we are doing this now with, with Zoom, um, you're seeing that you know, certain stocks are, are you know, uh, reaching rocket highs. When you think of COVID and Brexit in general, what is the impact on the investment landscape? So let me take those separately because I think they're, they're actually two, two quite different things. So in terms of COVID, um, I, I, I think there's, there's going to be some lasting impacts. I certainly hope I'll be traveling a little bit less going forward than the amount of travel that I undertook uh, uh, pre-COVID. I think it's now become quite accepted to raise capital more via Zoom calls than uh, physical meetings. I, and I think you can do that with partners that you know well, I think if there is new partners, there will still be a lot of physical meetings. Um, but I do think the sort of balance between online and uh, in person is going to shift and is going to continue to shift uh, more permanently. Um, clearly, COVID has presented a lot of challenges in terms of local communities, in terms of the um, uh, companies that we have invested in. And I think it will affect to some degree our portfolio construction uh, going forward in terms of what we're investing behind, because some of the themes that we had looked at pre-COVID, I think have been sort of reinforced through COVID, which is, you know, healthcare, focus on healthcare, um, a, a, a focus on, uh, a digit, on the digital economy. Um, and uh, uh, for, for us very much so a focus on, on uh, uh, ESG and climate. Um, and, and I think those trends have been sort of reinforced through the, uh, through the COVID time. So I think there will be more that we're going to try to do um, uh, 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 around those areas uh, going forward as a result of COVID. Now, in terms of Brexit, um, uh, I think the last chapter on Brexit hasn't been written. Um, if, if we look at the agreement that has been reached, there's still a huge amount of uh, uh, gray areas where agreement, especially in terms of financial services, uh, where agreements have to be reached uh, in, in, in the next 12 months. Um, we're clearly positioned well in terms of KKR, how we are set up our legal structures uh, uh, to deal with Brexit. And uh, we think uh, it's going to offer some interesting opportunities in the UK uh, that we are, we are going to very much focus on. Well, to be honest, we are both or both firms are, are active in private markets. And what we have seen in the past you know, 10 years at least is an unprecedented valuation 
that happened in, in private markets. If you take, you know, companies in, in the technology sector, they, they, they are kept uh, longer and longer in private. If you see the, the valuations pre-IPO or pre-public markets, rocket highs, think of a Palantir or, or of an Uber or so. So many people are asking us, is this going to stay? So far, we have been on the right side, and uh, it turned out to be true that our view is, is right, that uh, the value creation is very much happening in private markets. There is this outperformance of famous 8% or so on average between public markets and private markets. On the other hand side, we have a record high of dry powder. So what is your outlook in terms of returns for the industry, for the private markets or private equity industry going forward? So I think, first of all, the outperformance of PE as an industry uh, has historically always been more pronounced in periods of dislocation than in periods of overperformance. So I think, should we get a correction in terms of public markets during that period where the public markets are on a downturn, the private markets have actually outperformed by more than, than the average. Um, you know, I, now, will we get a period of, uh, of correction? I, I think the markets are cyclical and eventually uh, the markets uh, uh, will, will uh, adjust. Um, but I, am, I don't think that's something that we're going to see anytime soon because just the flow of money that the central banks uh, are pumping into the world economy will certainly uh, keep the current market performance going for some time longer. And if I knew when that would stop, uh, I, <laughs> I'd probably be in a different business. So I think that's very difficult to predict. I think all, all that I can say is that uh, I feel that the trend of more capital coming into private markets will continue um, uh, because there is this outperformance. I don't think that outperformance is going to change. Um, and uh, is the absolute return that private markets are going to generate adjust? Yes, I mean, quite frankly, it should adjust um, because if we are saying we're outperforming the uh, uh, public markets by a certain percentage, if public market performance adjusts, in, in other words, the uh, private markets performance should also adjust. And on the question of dry powder, um, you know, I, I've, this is a question that I think has haunted me throughout my entire career. Um, uh, and, and as you mentioned, when, when we started KKR in, in 1999, we were nervous that there was too much capital in the private equity industry. And, and so, and, and every four or five years, we get this question saying, well, there's way too much capital in the industry. So far, I think to some degree, the capital that comes into this industry has created its own opportunities. And I think that that's going to continue. And if we look at the number of private companies, for example, that still exist in Europe, there is a, there is a, a very large universe so that I don't think the opportunities are gonna go away. Johannes, we at Moonfair, and this is a very deliberate, very you know, conscious decision, we, we love buyout. Yeah? Uh, we love also other asset class, but, uh, classes, but buyout is really, the core of, of what we've um, been doing since the inception of the company. And the buyout segment, interestingly, is increasing when it comes to fundraising. Yeah? Certain other strategies, growth, um, you know, venture uh, are falling behind a bit and, and it, it continues to grow. And we like buyout so much because we are big believers that firms like KKR you know, are playing the, the playbook of globalization. You know, you have global footprint, uh, you are uh, controlling your own destiny in terms of playing operational playbooks with KKR Capstone and other resources you have at hand. What is your view on, on the specific buyout segment and why is this segment outperforming probably, you know, other segments of the markets like mid cap and small cap? So I, I, I think um, in, inherently there, there's a few things where, you know, but, but when we get a larger, slightly larger company, I think we can attract, attract better management talent. Um, and, and that's really one of the key differentiators. If you ask a top world-class manager, would you like to come and manage my $50 million company? he's not likely to be interested. If you are tell him, look, would you like to come and help us manage this $5 billion company? I think we can really get some incredible talent to help us do that. 
So I think the type of people that we get to run our companies are uh, more talented, if you will, than uh, uh, without a prerogative to, to, to manage our small businesses, there's good managers of small businesses, but I just think we get better global talent. Um, I think by definition, larger businesses tend to be more global businesses. So they're active across more geographies. And that's something where we with the KKR Global Footprint and some of our competitors, we can help these people on a global basis. And um, I, I think that's a, a, another one, a reason for getting incremental returns uh, out of those businesses. And I, I also think the, the ability that we have through our own global footprint to identify themes and trends and then find businesses that correspond to those themes and trends, again, help us uh, to generate, uh, generate good, uh, good returns. And you're absolutely right. If you look at the statistics historically, um, uh, uh, the buyout sector has always performed best. And especially in Europe, the buyout sector has by far outperformed what we've seen in the venture sector, despite you know, these huge gains that you reach about, uh, read about that people generate on the venture sector. Overall, as an industry, um, uh, 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 the buyout industry has generated better returns. Look, we will give um, you know, the audience people uh, the opportunity to ask questions. So uh, if you have those, please uh, prepare them and, and, and hand them in. Uh, but before we go there, Johannes, going away a little bit from this macro view, we are talking about more micro. So when you think of you know, evaluating an opportunity um, for KKR, uh, a deal, are there any specifics that you can share you know, what kind of businesses you like most, what you're looking for, what your current themes are? So, I mean, that's a good question and we're very much uh, uh, thematically driven. So we, we, we like to identify certain themes that we try to invest behind. And as I said, we do feel healthcare as a, as a sector is a very much a growing sector. And obviously through the COVID period, that's, uh, that's been sort of uh, uh, reconfirmed. Um, so that's an area that we're, we're quite keen on. Um, uh, we invested uh, uh, just last year in Elsan, the largest private hospital business in France. And so these are the type of opportunities that we're looking forward um, uh, to, to invest behind that trend. Digitalization is very much another trend. Again, these are not trends that we just came up with during the COVID times that I have to add. We had those before, um, uh, uh, but that, that again got, uh, got sort of reinforced uh, through COVID. And um, uh, here we've invested in a, in a French public company called Devotim, which is a software business. Um, uh, there is a number of other companies that we've invested behind uh, to take advantage of that uh, sort of trend of uh, digitalization. Um, and, and it really permeates all, uh, all industry sectors that we invest behind. And then what, what I think is, is really a sort of KKR um, uh, Europe uh, special is that we have what we call partnership transactions. So transactions where we have invested with a founder, entrepreneur, or a family that owns a business uh, whereby we um, come in as a minority or as a majority, really depending on the case, and we help uh, that founder to grow his business further geographically uh, with the full support of what KKR has to offer. And that sort of partnership has really worked very well for us. We've quite a lot of the transactions that we've uh, invested in have been uh, uh, along, along that line. The largest one uh, and most recent one is the Axel Springer investment. Uh, we are investing alongside Friede Springer and Matthias Döpfner and uh, in, a, in a partnership transaction to try to help uh, grow that business. So those are probably the three key themes that we've, uh, we've invested behind over the last few years. Johannes, I have a difficult question for you and probably you say it's a stupid one, but is there any one deal, and you have done so many deals, countless, any one deal you're most proud of or which was most, I don't know, sophisticated or difficult to, to get done? So I, I, I think it's a, I, I think it's like to ask which one is your favorite child, right? And uh, I, I love all my kids, so I love all my deals. Um, uh, and and there isn't, you know, they all have different, uh, diff, they all have different challenges. Um, uh, uh, I learn different things from different transactions. Um, not, not everything that I've done has worked out. 
Um, and you know, there's some transactions where we made 16 times our money. So that's probably the most we've ever made on one deal. There's other transactions where we, which were very, very complex. Our recent uh, a listing of Pensold, the uh, ex Airbus uh, electronic defense business, where we worked with the German government uh, with a lot of different constituents, which was highly complex. Um, uh, uh, so probably in terms of complexity it takes, uh, takes a price. So there's different, uh, I, I would say different reasons um, uh, that I'm, I'm, I'm proud of different companies. Um, uh, and, and there isn't really one where I would say that's, that's the deal, um, it, you know, can't, can't pick one, sorry. No, then, then let, let me come up with an easier question, uh, hopefully to answer. If you could go back in time, and you know, think of Johannes you know, 20 years ago. What advice would you give to yourself, you know, being uh, 20 years ago uh, a younger man? So I, I think if I could, so first of all, we should have done way more deals 20 years ago because the market was obviously a little less competitive, prices were much lower, and uh, but we agonized over those decisions at the time, uh, uh, found them very difficult. So I, but I would really say um, uh, to trust, uh, uh, trust your gut instinct. Um, and when, when I look back, uh, uh, very often we hesitated, we reevaluated, we did a lot of intellectual exercises, went through a lot of information, spent a lot of time to then arrive at the decision that was probably the gut instinct in the first time, in the first place. And so I think trusting that more. Uh, would, would really be uh, uh, one of the key uh, key advices. Thank you so much. I have so many more questions, but I want to give the audience now a chance really to to uh, uh, get a voice here and, and ask questions. So Pablo, if you um, and, and Zeke and team um, yeah. read out questions that that came up from the audience. You know, I have so many more, but but uh, give it a give it a chance now. Sure. Um, so here comes one. Um, there's there's been historically an inverse relationship between average private market valuations at the time a fund begins and the fund's eventual returns. Given where valuations are now, uh, could that dynamic create a problem for funds launching this year, Johannes? Yeah, I, th I think timing in our industry is, is, uh, is difficult because, you know, first of all, we have six years to invest the capital that we're entrusted with. Um, and uh, as, as, as Stefan's just said, uh, we, we invested a lot of money last year when we thought the conditions were a little bit more attractive and we're probably going to be a little bit slower this year. So we, 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 we like to look at where the market is and, um, and, and make decisions based on that. I, I think it's very tough to sort of say, look, this vintage um, uh, is, is more difficult than uh, a vintage that's been la launched in a time of dislocation. Um, and, and the reason is that if we're going to launch a fund this year, we're probably going to start to invest this fund sometime in the middle or late next year. And um, uh, if we have a correction by then, or maybe uh, 12 months later, the majority of that fund will be invested in that period. So I, I think that that sort of timing game, I, I think is tough. Um, I, I, I don't um, think you can, you can really do that. And quite frankly, when I look at the most, what I would consider the most successful investors in our industry, they very much have a, a continuous deployment approach uh, uh, to their investment thesis rather than trying to uh, time vintages. Okay, thank you. We have a couple questions related to growth. Um, uh, we'll see if we have time for both, but the first one, following the introduction of, of KKR's new growth technology or NGT strategy, what are some other areas for expansion for KKR like long-term capital funds, sector specialized funds, or any other investment strategies? And which ones are you uh, most excited by, Johannes? So we, we, I mean, we have a, a healthcare growth strategy um, and I'm, I'm quite excited about that. Uh, because it's a, it, it's a very interesting sector. Uh, I'm getting older, so I'm more interested in healthcare. Uh, and um, uh, it, it's a fund which has had some, had some uh, very good performance. What uh, we have also launched and, and our, our first inf impact fund, and we are now um, uh, sort of 
40, 50% invested in that. Um, and then we've uh, looked at a long-term strategy uh, as well. Um, I would say uh, personally, um, uh, really one of my uh, strategic priorities uh, this year is to have our firm do more on impact and ESG. So I'm very excited that we have a fund there um, uh, that, that we're investing behind this. And I'm uh, extremely interested to continue to drive that theme across everything that we do. And when my vision is that like today for us, digital is something that we look at across all of the industries that we're investing in, across all of the different funds that we're active in. And uh, really my vision is that that's gonna be the same for uh, uh, our ESG strategies. Okay, um, with respect to deal sourcing, how would you rate the competition now? Um, are you seeing you know, fierce competition for assets? And if so, how are you at KKR keeping the edge? Yeah, I mean, I think everything is competitive. Um, and, uh, you know, the, you just need to look at average prices, which is sort of uh, the statistics, evidence, statistic evidence of that. And um, we're trying to leverage our global network, um, uh, our uh, country uh, presence, our know-how in certain industries, which are really all around the themes that I talked about. Um, and, and to, uh, uh, to leverage that. Um, it's, it's our day-to-day -day business uh, uh, that we try to stay on top of that, uh, but it's a competitive world right now, no question. Okay, um, maybe just one more. Sure. How, how would you rate the prospects of technology growth equity investing in the coming years in Europe specifically? I think it's a very exciting area, um, uh, and uh, you know, I, I, we have invested behind some excellent businesses in Europe in our uh, technology growth fund that have performed very well. And and I do think uh, we we may need a little bit more help from the governments uh, to make uh, startups easier, uh, to make the uh, legal and and tax uh, environment. Uh, more uh, more supportive for, for that ecosystem. And I think there's a lot of uh, things that we're working on with, with the various governments to, uh, to give our input into that. But overall, I think it's a, it's a secular trend that's not gonna go away and that we're gonna continue to, uh, to try to invest behind. Great, thank you so much. Um, Stefan, I, I turn it back over to you. Uh, look, uh, Johannes, thanks so much so far. But before we sort of you know, close the session, there's one more question that I have, and which is, if you had to summarize your time at KKR in one word, what would it be? For me, it's fun. I, I've been having a lot of fun doing what I'm doing. Otherwise, I wouldn't be doing it. Uh, and uh, no, it's been, it's, it's been a fabulous journey and it's been a lot of fun um, uh, building the business and uh, uh, working with uh, so many entrepreneurs and exciting people, so. That's, that's really the key word for me. Look, I'm so glad to hear it. I asked a friend of mine the same question in a private environment and, and his answer was prison. So fun is by far a better <laughs> one. Thanks so much, Johannes, for, for your time and for, for, the, for the great insights here. Uh, and thanks so much to our audience for, for listening into our first deal talk. There's more to come. Thank you, stay safe. Uh, hopefully soon again. Thank you very much. Thanks, Stefan.